There it is, fellas. Yeah? I'll mind y'all going down like this. There it is. There's the wall. Good God, look at that. We would like to do a tune for you since today is Thanksgiving. And as John said a while ago, a lot of people do care. And this is our little contribution to you. Thank you for joining us for this uh, interview today. I'm really eager to talk to you about the making of the, uh, the concert video at Sing Sing in 1972. Can you talk a little bit about how you got started in this, in this business? Think about the time, 1972. First of all, the 60s had occurred. And in the 60s, 16 millimeter independent filmmaking was on the rise. There were hundreds of filmmakers like me who picked up a camera and went into the street, basically filming stories, and every story was new. Nobody had ever filmed anything like this stuff, A, and B, nobody had ever been filmed. So 16 millimeter, while a heavy camera, uh, maybe 50 pounds almost with a battery and a sound man by your side, sometimes with a wire, um, was very exciting. People were thrilled. And I was a fairly well-known filmmaker at that time because I was one of the maybe 10 16 millimeter filmmakers who began to work for PBS when it began and even before for NET, National Educational Television. So I was what was called an independent filmmaker. And we were very upset, my partner and I, by this thing called Attica. Attica was in upstate New York. Attica was a really rough prison you have to remember at the time, none of us knew anything about these prisons. They were these old, scary looking buildings that nobody ever came in on into and nobody ever went out of as far as we knew. We didn't know what was going on in there, except there was an electric chair, we knew that. And something happened in Attica and there was this huge rebellion. And in this rebellion, I don't know, some 20 some inmates were killed and guards were injured, I believe some guards were killed, and the country turned on the prisons and said, what is this? Nobody had any idea. So my partner and I, we lived in Ossining, New York, right near Sing Sing Prison. And we went into the warden and we said, you know, maybe the inmates would like to have a program, like a class in how to make film, how to tell stories, um, a storytelling class. And the warden, some old guy, said, uh, okay, what do you need? And we said, a room. And he said, okay. And in we walked. There were about 50 inmates. I look at them. They look at me. <laughs> you know, I'd never been in, and some of them had hardly ever been out. They'd been in so long. Well, of the 50, maybe 35 of the inmates stayed. And we began to teach this class. And they loved storytelling. They just thought it was fantastic. So we were doing something as a result of Attica, getting to know these guys. And the guys were, I would say, more than friendly. They were very cooperative. They wanted to do something. So we thought up this idea of a concert. Oh, we're going to start working on a film today. And this is the first time we have a film take on Cincy. First time, and I hope it won't be the last one either. And uh, we thank you all, you guys, for everything you've done. Uh, we're going to have B.B. King, the boys of this island, John Baez, and all the guys from the team. There had been a concert, Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison, a rather famous documentary, which my partner had fought up. It was his idea. So he said, let's do a concert on Thanksgiving Day. And uh, we wrote a whole bunch of musicians uh, and some responded and some didn't. One was Joan Baez, 
who we had filmed before, my partner and I, and we knew she had a husband at the time who was in prison. Uh, she had some idea of it. We also knew there were a certain amount of um, Spanish speaking or secondary Spanish speaking inmates and she spoke Spanish. Um, she said, sure, I'll come. They say everything can be replaced. They say her distance is not near. Yet I remember every face of every man who put me We wrote B.B. King, having no idea what he would say, but he was the great blues artist of the time. And um, I would say had been written about in the press as very sympathetic to inmates in prisons. And he said, not only will I come, but I'll bring my entire 26 piece band at no cost. We didn't have much money anyway, so no cost was ideal. And the agent, the manager, who was a rather famous man at the time, said, there's this other group, uh, Voices of East Harlem. They're an up and coming group out of Harlem. Would you like them? We said, sure. And Jimmy Walker was a famous comedian at the time, dynamite he was, and uh, we said maybe he could be the host, kind of. Y'all ready? Yeah. They're ready. All right then. Yeah, well, I'm used to warming people up. You see, that's my job. We had no idea what was going to happen. I brought seven camera crews. I can remember the day before we entered the joint that I gathered all of these people, maybe 50 people in our team. And I said, you're all gonna be independent filmmakers because we don't know. You're gonna follow B.B. King. You're gonna follow Joan Baez. You're gonna be in the concert. You're gonna follow the inmates. And we gave the inmates a 16 millimeter camera, a cameraman and said, do whatever these guys say. And the lighting was major. The hall was so big and so old. The lighting was horrible yellow lights from the ceiling. So we brought in what was called 10Ks, huge lights. We used a 30 inches per second audio recorder, which has hardly ever been used in live performance because it's so big. Rolled that thing in, set up microphones all around, had audio going, holes completely empty. Go to the warden, the warden says, you guys ready? We're ready. Boom, he says, okay, let's do it. And in walk 1200 inmates. We already knew these guys and they knew us. That's one of the reasons the film has this intimate charm and fun to it. Warden had a lot of people around just in case somebody got out of hand, but it didn't feel scary at all. There were some women. I brought some women from the press. The New York Daily News and other papers came in. There were women in the group Voices of East Harlem. Joan Baez and her sister, she brought her sister who had hardly ever been recorded on film. And I don't believe there is another recording of Joan Baez and her sister singing and the day begins. So this is Sing Sing Thanksgiving. It happened that we filmed on Thanksgiving and what Thanksgiving meant to those guys was turkey, potatoes and the other stuff we all like. There wasn't any real historical context to Thanksgiving. There was just good food and a kind of a feeling that it was a holiday and let's celebrate it. Uh, we had turkey, dressing, cranberry sauce, peas, uh, pie, coffee, milk, the regular procedures that you have in any institution. This is about the best Thanksgiving that I had since last Thanksgiving. <laughs> You'll see moment after moment that's just wonderful. It's so real. It's so of the time. It's so almost sweet. I gotta tell you, as a person who had never been in the joint, some of the people shouldn't have been there, I felt. Uh, the guy who was my, one of my stars, Tony Pabone, 
ahead of the young lords. He had robbed television sets out of people's houses. He'd never really done anything violent. He had 17 years in the joint. We also met, met some very old guys, some guys on death row. It was highly emotional. And since nobody had ever filmed in a prison before, we could really just sit with them and be with them. I admire the warden for the courage to do this. Mm -hmm. the, the, the guards, once they saw that we were going to paint a picture of all sides, we were not like lefties, as they call us now, who only cared about the inmates that they shouldn't be in prison. We, we didn't have that attitude. The guards kept cooperating, and you'll see scenes in the film where they're kidding and joking and telling us how it really is, or really was. I don't know whether things have changed in Sing Sing since 1972, but this is a time when America is soul searching. We had been through the Vietnam War, was still going on. We had the death of Kennedy, and then his brother, and then Martin Luther King, and then Kent State, and the election of President Nixon, who said he would end the war, but the war kept going. And a lot of people had dropped out. There were the hippies taking off. There was a women's movement. There was a whole uh, in Native American Indian rebellion going on. There were handicapped people who were protesting about sidewalks not having no places where they could roll. You can't imagine this time. And at that time also, it was, you felt like America was changing. The film is about 90 minutes. How hard was it for you to leave stuff out? I mean, how much did you leave out? The film was made over two days. One day, the day before Thanksgiving, before any of the musicians had come, we got the sense of the place. We walked around with a lot of freedom. Sure, there was a guard with us, good for that, but you could see we're in the cafeteria, we're in other places where people are working, we're interviewing a guard, as he drives his little truck around the prison, a wonderful character. And then there's Thanksgiving Day itself, the real concert, the real thing. And then we're out of there. So smart guy that I am, I threw out the outtakes, all that wonderful stuff of B.B. King, of the inmates, of the warden. He does show his little museum, which I assume is still there. What a wonderful museum. And the charm that he had. So all that's gone. Um, that's really too bad. So the 90 minutes is all that there is remaining. Now let's look at what happened to this film at the moment. We made it as what was called a feature length documentary, 90 minutes, which would run in the theater. It never did run in the theater for a whole bunch of reasons, but it ran on PBS prime time. And it was very, very popular on PBS. Everybody watched it. Everybody realized this was B.B. King at his greatest. Now B.B. King said, that this was the greatest moment he had had in performance up until that time. Why? First of all, he knew the recording quality was very high. Second of all, there's something in the relationship between the audience and him where sort of everybody knows the blues and you can feel it. This wasn't a mixed audience whom he, he loved performance and he was a beautiful man, but this particular audience knew the blues and he knew the blues. And they went like that at that moment. And everyone in the audience and in the, like, on stage and among the camera crew and among the press felt it. It was like electric. That he better ride some instruments on his relationship of the audience to the other performers was was good but it didn't it didn't match the relationship with bb king did you sense that for example when when uh, mimi farina came on with joan baez i think that picked up and they sang in spanish and there was a kind of energy that you felt but this was not a folk a folk life or a, um, a folk song audience uh, did you but they seemed to accept except them. Joan Baez and her sister, Mimi Farina, they step on stage, brave women, and the audience is very mixed about these people. Who the hell are you? You're folk artists. You come from California. You're pretty girls. You know, we're not impressed. <laughs> and that's tough. There were actually boos 
in the audience, but I cut those out. You never hear those boos. Out of respect for Joan Baez, truth of that scene is they fought hard to get the audience's attention because when they're singing in Spanish, most of the audience doesn't know what they're talking about. And she does sing some very powerful songs and it is an important moment in her career that she did it, that she stepped in there, that she showed support for the inmates. As for your perception about the scene, it was less powerful for the audience than Bibi or than the voices of East Harlem who knocked their socks off. Was there anything beside losing the outtakes that uh, you were disappointed in, um, in this experience uh, that, that you felt um, that you'd want to do over? There's no such thing as doing over in a documentary of this type. You got it, you run it, you go in the editing room, you do the best you can, you always miss certain things. I'll give you a moment that nobody knows about. So there was this guy, Tony Pabone. He is one of the stars. You see him at the very opening, at the very first scene. Without Tony Pabone, we would not have been able to make the movie. He had ability, although he was five foot two, to go to the different groups inside the prison and get support. And there was one time where one guy stuck his finger in my back and I, I thought it was a knife and he acted like it was a knife. And Tony Bone said, cut that out, that's David. And the guy said, oh, I'm sorry, and he stopped. We said to the warden when the film was done being shot, look, why don't you let Tony Pabone out on our recognizance? We will make him part of our company and he'll become a worker in very directions, the name of my film company. And the warden did. Tony Pabone got out and he went and became part of our recognizance. He worked in our company for about four months and he did some good work uncovering stories. And, and uh, then he said, I want to start a magazine for inmates and ex-inmates. Give me $5,000. You got it, Tony. You're on that magazine. And that's the last we ever saw of Tony Pabone. <laughs> I have no idea what happened to Tony Pabone or where he went. So my regrets are that I didn't keep in touch with some of these guys. The class produced really talented folk, some of whom are in the movie. I mean, there's Miguel Pinheiro. He wrote this Short Eyes. He was in the class. That's where he started his writing. And he became a nationally known poet, a screenwriter. I think he's passed on now. So these guys were talented and they knew the talents each other had. Uh, so I would say the loss of Tony Pabone, I regret very much and I wish that I knew that he was still alive all these years later. The sense of the other inmates who helped us, it was like we faded into our world. And if you watch the end of the film, there's a statement by Tony Pabone, unpracticed, unwritten, unrehearsed, that just says what he hopes for the future. And I know a lot of them did. And then it was, we were two separate worlds again. Mm -hmm. The one original song that came out of the uh, video was Joan Baez at the end during the credits. I think that's a wonderful song. Everybody who worked on this film, this moment in time, was deeply touched by the experience. Other members of my crew today still remember that moment. And Joan Baez was very affected by that. After all, she was very involved with prisoners, inmates, because her husband was in prison. And I think she was sort of on the side of the inmates. When you actually walk into that prison, or I guess any old building, with the gates and the sounds and the checking, you don't forget that experience. And when you enter the hall, as she did, sit on the stage with inmates and performers all around you, and then step up and sing to those guys, I, I don't imagine she had too many experiences in her life like that one. So David, did you ask her to, or did she volunteer to write that song at the end, that's at the end when the credits roll? The song you hear at the end of my film, written by Joan Baez, and came from Joan Baez. We didn't ask it. That's asking a lot to ask a performer of her level to write a song. But she said, I want to do it. 
And she wrote that song that memorializes that day and the film and her experience. Sing, sing, ah, sing, what a thing to be. A thousand men locked in that pen on a winter's day with a sky so gray that the heaven... Another question, should we do a 50th anniversary concert of some kind? to commemorate that, that event. You know, they did, a, they did a 50th anniversary of Woodstock. It didn't work out too well. Um, sometimes it's not, you can't recapture the magic of something like that. In two years from the time where we're sitting right now, the film will be 50 years old. My experience with it is having shown it for a variety of audiences over those years, there is no replacing that moment in time. Nothing modern would feel exactly like that moment. The inmates had never had a concert or anything like it. We had never been in the joint or anything like it. The world had never seen anything like it because even though Johnny Cash at Folsom Prison was done before this film, there's no interaction between Johnny Cash and the inmates. That was my decision. I wanted real interaction. I wanted the real experience. And the warden and the inmates gave my team the chance Every member of my team that I selected to work on that film had an understanding for this type of documentary, the reality of it, the handheldness of it, the moment by moment experience, the kidding that went on. It's a moment in time. I would not, uh, I would honor the film and that moment and all those people by running that film for an audience on a big screen with a good sound system, because it sounds really good considering how old the film is, wow. it's optical soundtrack but it's really good. Uh, and let the audience experience it as it was done at that time. You've done so much in your career on so many different subjects, but social justice has been one of the themes, one of the through lines through a lot of your work. Do you have um, any, new, any feelings about the national debate that's going on now about why do we have prisons? Can prisons be reformed? Can people be reformed? What's the purpose of prison? Any, any, any philosophical uh, or, or sort of practical uh, uh, thoughts that you have on that? We are doing this recording on a November day in 2020. And I'm doing this recording because I believe that history is really important for people to understand America, our role right now, what it's like how we got to be where we are. And I have a great faith in America. I'm, I'm beyond fortunate to be a child of an immigrant, to come to this country and be having this experience. And I hope that 50 years from now, who knows what prisons will be like, the same, maybe, changed, maybe, we don't really know. You'll be able to look at this moment, at least the contribution of my film, and I'm very appreciative of getting the chance to share it with all the people who come to the museum, and that you have a chance to look back and maybe you'll see change. As for what kind of change? Well, for all that the prison offered, it didn't offer real, real rehabilitation. I didn't see that. I didn't see that in the people I filmed, the old guys. It was more sad than anything else and a lot of them had to be there. Will that change over the next 50 years? You tell me, and if I have any ear, I'll be watching and I'll be listening, and I wanna know what happens to the prison system circa 2070 or beyond. Thanks again so much. It's so great to meet you. And um, I know this won't be the last uh, time we talk, but uh, have a great holiday and take care. A brand new forward. But you said I went in Cadillac. I bought you a ten dollar dinner. And you said thanks for the snack. But you live in my penthouse. You said it was just a shack. <laughs>